What do you do if you feel like you're stuck in a certain spot in life and you're stuck? And there's different ways of being stuck. One way of being stuck is that uh, you don't know where you want to go. You just don't know where, 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 where the destination is. Another way of being stuck is you know where to go, but you feel there's something holding you back from getting there. You know, in the first scenario, it's like you're a ship in the ocean, and you just don't know, don't know how to go anywhere. Or, like one guy put it, I feel like I'm, I'm an actor in a movie, I'm playing somebody, but don't have the, I don't have the, uh, I know the role, and I don't have the script. So, sometimes we have these, like, like hidden um, shackles, hidden cords, hidden ropes that are tying us down, and we want to um, break through them, we don't know how to break through. So tonight we're going to, Mr. Hashem, learn how to, uh, sometimes you're looking for that key, you want to get the key, you don't know where, and you can't find it. You have this empty piece of paper and you want to fill it, but you don't know, you don't know where to start. So we're learning, learning about this tonight, we're learning, learning this in memory of Dr. Bresman's father, Rabbi Arya Leib Ben Lazer. Come to have an aliyah, good to better for you, Dr. Bresman, for your family, for all good, b'seich la Yisrael. Achayim. So, we're learning this from the perspective of this week's Torah portion, and I'm going to share with you, a little later, a story you heard this week, that uh, I heard the story from Rabbi Mendel Shapiro, the uh, mentor of the Chesik uh, mentor of the yeshiva, and uh, he shared the story. We whole night we were bringing about the story, very deep, deep story. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go to this two story portion first. There is um, halacha. We learned this week about vows. Torah says that a Jew has ability to consecrate anything in the world, anything at all that they like, they could say, this uh, piece of meat should be considered like it's a sacrifice, like it's a holy piece of meat, and then it becomes forbidden. Um, and the reason why a person makes this kind of vow is because they're afraid that whatever may be in this, in this world, that they may feel an attraction to something that isn't good for them. They want to hold themselves back. And they would make this vow to, like, erase this option from their life. Like, let's say, for example, a smartphone. Some people have uh, made a lot of mistakes with smartphones. And uh, they make a vow. And the truth is, nowadays, it's not encouraged to make vows. Because they make promises, and then you get into more problems. But let's say this. You, you decide, and you make a strong decision, and you expel smartphones from your um, vicinity. You don't have a, smart, a smartphone anymore. So that decision is not a decision that it's, it's mandated officially by the Torah. It's something you've taken on yourself. You personally made this choice. You don't have to. It's like a vow. A vow is you take something which is officially kosher, and you decide that for me it's not going to be kosher. So is that a good thing? So there's a bit of a contradiction in the Talmud. One place in the Talmud, it, it says that a vow is good to keep yourself at a distance, for precious. Precious means to keep yourself above, above the here and now, above the, above the earthy and the physical. On the other hand, the Talmud Yerushalmi says, you're making vows? Are you kidding? Is it not sufficient for you what the Torah itself prohibited? Are you looking for other prohibitions? You, 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 have you aced all the 365 negative commandments? You want to add a 366th? Thing that's forbidden, why are you adding more things? So which one is it? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? It's a beautiful teaching of the Alt Rebbe on this Torah portion that he addresses it. He says, being the Torah portion talks about a young girl making a vow. Then it says how she gets married and her husband absolves her vows. So Alt Rebbe says, if you're young, meaning if you have an attraction to something which isn't good for you, then it's good to cut things out of your life. If there's something that you have this young, youthful, foolish, attachment to, doesn't matter how old you are, your passport, you have something that doesn't belong in your life and you're, and you're, and you're, you're um, flirting with something which isn't good for you, so then it's good to cut it out of your life. Don't go near there. Don't go near there. Don't, 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 don't tempt yourself. Every day in our prayers we say to Hashem, please don't, give me, don't bring me to a place of a challenge. Don't bring me to that place. I don't want to be in a place of a challenge. So that's a good thing. On the other hand, 
if you keep that momentum going, when you've already succeeded in eliminating that that um, challenge from your life, then you're cutting yourself off from other opportunities. Let's go back to the cell phone, the smartphone. There are a lot of things, let's face it, you could do with the smartphone, you cannot do with the regular phone. So if that smartphone is no longer a challenge for you, then cutting it out of your life is is a mistake because you now have an opportunity, you could do a lot of good things with it. So if you if you had this challenge before and now you want to eliminate it, I wouldn't advise you to do it on your own because chances are that everyone, Adam Karavitz, lots of people are, people are always um, uh, prone to make a mistake about themselves, that little bit uh, prejudice comes to ourselves. So, but ask your personal spiritual mentor, you know, there's something you took on yourself a while ago, you eliminated whatever it was, it doesn't have to be in your life, but could bring benefit, benefit to the world, pay perhaps. So, you, I not, so you, at one point, you, um, you had this vow, at one point you... I don't mean literally a vow, but you cut it out. But now it's good. Now it's a good thing for you. So that's why, on the one hand, the Talmud says vows are good, but in Hoya Sili Ish, if you achieve a bond with Hashem in a higher level, then there's no longer a need for the vow. The vow was necessary originally, and now it's no longer necessary. That's how the Maharal explains uh, the Rav Nassim. The Gemara says, in the Gemara in the Rav Nassim says, anyone who accepts upon themselves a vow, if it, can anyone turn on that fan? Uh, and we, thank you so much, Abel. Sorry for uh, disturbing you. Thank you very much. Um, the Ramnasan says, if anyone accepts upon themselves any, a vow, it's as if they built a bama. What is a bama? So we're learning now the laws of building the base of Migdash. It's customary during these three weeks to focus on the studying about how to build the base of Migdash because by studying about the base of Migdash, it's as if we... Participate in building the base of Mikdash, or as the Rebbe says, studying of the base of Mikdash is actually is fulfilling the mitzvah of the base of Mikdash. You're actually contru- creating something by studying about the base of Mikdash. So one of the things we learn about the base of Mikdash is that the altar that was in Jerusalem was built in the same spot where um, our forefathers Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov offered their sacrifices, where Noah offered his sacrifices, and where Adam was created from. Adam was created from that same spot. The Talmud says, Adam a person was created from his place of atonement. However, it wasn't always a thing that you brought sacrifices in the temple. Let's say um, Vitali wants to make a barbecue. He doesn't want uh, you know just to be a barbecue. He wants to be a little holier than a barbecue. So he says, you know, I'm going to offer a carbon shlamim. I'm going to offer a sacrifice in my backyard. That was okay. That was a mitzvah. Until the temple was set in Jerusalem, you have a backyard sacrifice. And more accurately, when, when there was a set place, for example, in Shiloh, in Shiloh, for many hundreds of years, um, the temple was in, Mishkan was in Shiloh. At that time, it was forbidden to offer a backyard sacrifice. Once it was an established communal place, you couldn't do a backyard sacrifice. But until then, you could build what's called a bama. A bama is a backyard sacrifice. So the Talmud compares building a bama to making a vow. Why? So Maral says it's simple, because you're going on your own path over here with your vows. Everyone is doing the same thing, and you've made your own path. So is that a positive thing? Well, it depends. If you're a sanctuary, if you've achieved a higher level of holiness, so why are you cutting yourself off from everybody else? If you've achieved a higher level of holiness, you don't need to have the bummer. You don't need to have additional restriction. If you're challenged... Let's be honest. All of us have challenges. And, and there are some things that we need to vow, restrictions, some things we don't, and everyone's different. But if you have already achieved a safe space with whatever it was that's challenged you before, then don't abstain from it. Use it. Use it for only. Use, use, it, use it for good. Uh, you were previously an alcoholic. You couldn't touch this stuff. And uh, it, it no longer interests you. So doesn't mean you can't say L'chaim if I bring it now? Okay, I wouldn't tell you to do this on your own, but let's say your sponsor, Neye, says, you know, time for L'chaim. No, then you know it's time for L'chaim. Anyway, so, uh, so, so, so the point is that the Maharal says the issue with building, making, hey, Shalom Aleichem. The issue with, um, making, a sac- with um, making a vow is that you're making your own path. And when everyone's on a certain path together and you go on your own path, it's not a good thing. You may need to sometimes, 
But when you're a Shiva Mikdash, you achieve some kind of set plateau in your service of Hashem, then you don't need to go on your own path. Going your own path and making your own rules isn't always a good thing. Everyone's staying after after um, Meyer tonight to join a class together, and you want to do something by yourself. Maybe not a good idea. You want to join everyone together. Why don't you do your own thing? It's, it's a power in, in, in the energy of everyone getting together. So so you might you could accomplish something by yourself too, but there's something more you can accomplish with the, with a group. So the Maharal says that's what the Gemara compares it to building a Bama. There's another reason for this. Another reason for this is this. Often, you know what kind of vows people make? Make a vow, I will never go into your house again. Maybe, maybe Sephardim are, are better at these kinds of vows, or worse at these kinds of vows than Ashkenazim. They get a little, they have a little more energy, a little more warmth. Ashkenazim, we could say hello and goodbye, and we love you and we hate you, wouldn't ever, ever know. But Sephardim, they hate you, they'll tell you. I will never go in the guy's house again. How dare the guy do this? Um, Moroccans. Okay, so why am I picking on you? L'chaim, l'chaim. <laughs> <coughs> so I, the reason I mention Moroccans is because is because someone I was, I was saying this about Sephardim. Someone said, "No, it's Moroccans. It's Moroccans. <laughs> it's not Moroccans. Ashkenaz do the same thing. We have the same problems. But whatever. We could pretend it's not us. Anyways, the point is, everybody gets angry sometimes. And when you get angry, what are you doing? Get angry? You promise, I'll never walk into this house. I'll never go into that show. I'll never. I'll never. Go, I'll never. I'll never eat that food. I'll never do this. And, and, and what's really going on? It sounds like a noble thing. You're protecting something by making that vow. What are you protecting? What are you honoring? What are you offering on your bama, on your on your your ego? Ego. Your ego. You're sanctifying your animal soul. You're exalting your animal soul, and you're saying, "I want to upraise, lift up my ego." It it comes from a very noble, holy place, but really, what's going on is you're uh, you're, you're 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 lifting up your ego, and it's a problem. It's a problem that, and maybe maybe we don't make vows. Uh, overtly and say I'm making a vow, but it could be that deep down, like you make these promises to yourself, get angry and make a decision. And so that's why it's compared to a, a bummer for idolatry. It's idolatry. You're offering a sacrifice? No, but a sacrifice to idolatry. But then there is another kind of of a vow. And this is what we started off talking about tonight. And that is a vow, it's not officially really a vow, it's a sort of kind of inhibition that you may have because of something that happened to you in your life. I don't want to uh, give you the wrong idea and make this as dramatic as it sounds, but I'll tell you the story as it happened. I was telling my children, my children are now counselors in camps in Gagne Sol in Montreal in New York, and I remember one counselor coming over to me when I was eight years old and saying, you know, Levin, you're weird. You're weird. Just, just so you know, you're weird. <laughs> I didn't get emotionally scarred. I remembered it. But I didn't, I didn't, it didn't bother me so much, but... It's not a good thing to do, right? Sometimes, it happens, sometimes you make a mistake when you're younger, you make a mistake, or you think you made a mistake, or someone embarrassed you, someone shamed you, and because of that, you may not realize it, but you will have a hard time to open up your heart and to love someone. You may become very suspicious. You may become very suspicious of people because of something that happened to you a long time ago, and you may not be able to trust people because something that happened, you don't, even, you don't even know. And so deep down, subconsciously, you make a vow. I'm not saying you actually promise something, but you put this like like obstacle in yourself, you're not able to go further. You don't even realize. It is an experiment about um, monkeys. They took these monkeys into a um, cage and they, uh, and they um, put bananas on top of the ladder. And whenever a monkey stepped on the ladder, all the monkeys received a freezing shower. So uh, the monkey stopped going on the ladder. But then he switched out one of the monkeys with another monkey. And that monkey doesn't know about anything, so he walks up to the ladder. And all the other monkeys grab him and say, no, 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 don't go, don't go near that, that, that ladder. That ladder is no good. They switch a second monkey, and a third monkey, and a fourth monkey. And now you have four new monkeys who have never seen the shower. And yet, they're all not touching the ladder, and they're all pushing everyone away from going on that ladder. They have never, never seen the shower, but they got used to something. There's a guy who... He's very upset at his mother because his mother never showed him any warmth. And he told his rabbi about it, a friend of mine, and the rabbi went with him to, to his mother and they discussed it. And, and he, the, rabbi, like, the guy's a lot of problems because he never got any love from his, mm. from his parents. And so she said, Rabbi, what do you want from me? I grew up in a Russian orphanage. I was never hugged or kissed in my life. I'm not able. I'm not able to love. I'm not able to kiss. I'm not able to hug. 
So it's a kind of a, a vow, a, 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 an obstacle that for it, it doesn't. It's not really an obstacle, but we've gotten stuck in something, and we and we convince ourselves, and we stay this way. And let's say something more of a, something we could relate to, perhaps. Right, you see your child, you see a friend. And they're in a state where they're unable to do something very, very simple. Very simple. It looks like a very simple thing. Um, it looks like a very simple thing, but the guy says, I can't do it. I can't do it. And I'm afraid. And nothing to be afraid of. You, you know, whatever the scenario is, the, the guy has this fear. And what do you want to do as a parent? What do par- some parents do? They scream at the kid, just go. We make a big deal. Does it work? Doesn't work. And sometimes not only does it does not work, but you're giving pain to the child. The child doesn't doesn't know, doesn't know what you want from them. They feel they feel upset because they, they, they're now like disappointing you, and they're and they, and they feel weird and they feel different and they don't understand. But how can you help the child? How can you help a child or a friend who feels locked in, or yourself? You're locked into something for such a, such a long time ago, and you um you you love if you could just you know go out of this and but 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 you can't and especially if it's someone else you wish you could like like bring them out of it so it it, it starts because we are living like these monkeys and we've made this decision subconsciously or consciously and the question is how do we get out of it and the answer is ein chavush materas atzmo someone who's imprisoned never pull themselves out of prison. The children who are in this phobia, whatever the, their fear is, can't get out of it by themselves. So how can you help them? You see a child who's on crutches. How can you help the child on crutches? Tell them to run faster? Has to show. We do assume it's causing him pain. How do you get it? How do you help him? So let's go to Yom Kippur. No, it's not yet Yom Kippur. Let's let's go let's take a little trip to Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. Hashem doesn't play tricks with His creatures. What do we do on the holiest day of the year? The holiest day of the year, and the holiest time in the holiest day of the year, Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre, we come together, what do we do? We annul our vows. I don't know about you, but I think of the mistakes I made, I wouldn't put vows on the top five <laughs> mistakes I made in my life. I wouldn't put them in the top, I made other mistakes I could think is bigger, bigger than those, the, the making vows. Why is that the thing? On Yom Kippur, we annul our vows. What does that mean? And, and especially, it, you don't need Yom Kippur to annul your vows. Annulling vows is with a Jewish court. And we annul our vows Rosh Hashanah already. Or Rosh Hashanah, before Rosh Hashanah we annul our vows. What's the idea of annulling our vows in Yom Kippur? What does that mean? And what it means is this. It's not about actually annulling a vow. It's about starting a new page. It's about, it's about, taking, about freeing ourselves from all the things that bog us down. I want to tell you the story that I, that I started with, saying that I promised I'll tell you later. Here's the story. Unbelievable. This guy made a big mistake. And I told this story to you. He made a big mistake. And he asked the Rebbe for a tikkun for his mistake. A rectification for his soul. So Rebbe responded, the tikkun is to give tzedakah beyond your ability. Give tzedakah more than you can. Now, he thought about it, and he couldn't figure out what that meant exactly. Do, should I skip lunch from now on? And, and you use the money for lunch for, for Saka? Should I skip dinner? Should I skip breakfast? I mean, at what point am I done? Beyond my ability. What's my ability? What's not my ability? And he got really confused and he wrote again to the What do you mean? Well, just tell me what you mean. I'll do anything. I just, just explain what you mean. I never answered him. <coughs> Give according to the generosity of your pure heart. What Rebbe did by those words is something fascinating. <coughs> The, Rebbe, an, 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 the first response that we gave him left the guy banging his head against the wall. In Jewish thought, there are schools of thought called Musr. Musr means uh, ethics, but the school of thought of Musr is very pushy. Very pushy. The first answer that ever might have been interpreted as Musr hurt yourself, bang your house, just, just break yourself, break yourself. You did something bad, break yourself. But the Rebbe's second answer is opposite. The Rebbe says, you have in your pure heart, you think you don't have a pure heart because of the mistake that you made. In you, you have the answer. Your pure heart has the answer of what you need to do. You want to know what you should do? Ask inside of you. Do what you really want to do inside your pure heart. Think about you have a pure heart still, and that's where the answer is. That's what happens in Yom Kippur. 
On your Kippur, the Eidushter forgives us for our sins. Hashem forgives us for our sins. And Hashem says to us that all the mistakes you've made cannot detract one iota of the love that I have for you. That's what Hashem tells us. And if I forgive you, on Yom Kippur we call Hashem our Father, Kiracham of our Bonim, like a father has mercy in his children. So when the, in the face of the love of Hashem for us, we're able to let go of our vows. When we think about how Hashem doesn't play tricks with us, and Hashem, we have a part of Hashem inside us, and we have a, the part of Hashem in us has no limitations whatsoever, and there are no real obstacles, because as we say every morning, we start our day, we say, Moed Amin Fanacha, the soul you gave me is pure, so there are no real obstacles. No, no, the obs- when we think about in Yom Kippur, the love Hashem has for us, that melts away our bonds, that melts away our shackles, that melts, melts away all the promises and inhibitions that we think we can't, we think we can't, we're not able to. It's in, the, in, the, in the, looking at, the, at Hashem and Hashem's uh, love for us, that's what melts the melts the, um, the shackles. And similarly, in this week's Torah portion, what does the Torah say? Who knows the vows? A father. Who also knows the, also, also knows the vows? A husband. So what do, what do we say tomorrow in Eishas Chayel? Eishas Chayel begins with, who can find a woman of valor, right? Racha pimpinim michra. Her value is more than gems. So what does the next verse say? Batach bali baila that her husband's heart is secure, is trust in her, um, and he never is lacking anything. So he says, he doesn't lack anything. Um, so, what is the connection over here? The first verse is talking about how great, the, the whole section is talking about how great the wife is, from Lechem. Then it switches all of a sudden to talk about the husband. How did the husband come in over here? So the answer is, what uh, the woman has a great value, value beyond diamonds, but... How can you discover the diamonds? It's through the trust of the husband and his wife that allows her to find the diamonds. Me, Yimsa, who finds the woman of Allah? Maybe be married to a woman of Allah. You will never know. You will never know. How do you find the woman of Allah? It's through the trust you have in your, in your wife. It's a trust that she feels secure, that, that, you, that you see good in her. That's how she is able to... Um, I was talking to a couple today. Big challenges, challenges, the husband's threatening divorce, crazy stuff. And the issue, the issue was solved within five minutes. And the husband said to me, he looked at me like, are you Superman? Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and the answer is, I'm not really Superman. I, have, I, I, I happen to know that I'm not. I mean, kryptonite doesn't bother me. Anyways, but uh, <laughs> what, 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 what she needed, all she needed was, was that, to be a, a drop of, of respect, and, and and then she was able to just be herself. But that's that, that's really the reality of what happened. I, I'm not exaggerating. That's exactly what happened. So, in similar ways with our children, Torah says, "Who else knows a vow? A father knows a vow of his child." You can't. It's it's sad to see your child strapped in and bound. But when what you could do for your child is show your child, "I want to be with you. I love you. I want to listen to you. I want to be with you." And automatically. <laughs> The child gets confident, confidence, and is able to let go of the um, of the shackles that he has. <coughs> this is a message we have from Yom Kippur. It's not only for Yom Kippur; it's for the whole year. And, and that's what we, we have to think about. If we, if we get stuck in something, to think that Hashem is with me. Now, when this is in the Mengel language, who's a Holocaust survivor, he is a Holocaust survivor. When he was 16 years old. He was in Auschwitz, and he was there by the death marches. Famously. He had a story about how he, was, he couldn't. He had no strength to walk anymore. He had no strength, and as he's walking, and, he can, and he's about to just drop down and die, Chas He's now kind of hurt. I think he's only over ninety, uh, and he has great grand, hundreds of great grandchildren. He was about to lose the whole thing. And what gave him strength? He thought about his Shabbos table. He thought about his father telling a story at the Shabbos table about the Baal Shem Tev, and how this boy, this man wanted to go back home. And he, he was scared to go back home because he, he was had to travel through the forest. And the Baal Shem Tev said to him, Hashem is always with you. And the Tzermin Yisim and Gel was thinking, Hashem is with me. Hashem is with me. And that's what allowed him to overcome this, the, um, the challenge. And suddenly then, the Nazi, one of the Nazis offered him some coffee. I mean, Miguel said the, co- the coffee tasted to him like a Naven. He, he, he drank the coffee, and he, had, and he was revived, and, he, and he's alive to today, and Gazun. So this is in ourselves, our, our inner shackles, to think about Hashem is with us, and same is also with our children, people in our life, that you have, to, you have to give them the sense that you love them, and you trust them, and you believe in them, and that's you allow them to, to shed 
the 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 vows, the things that they, that they hold themselves back, they lose their trust, they lose their love, they lose their. And this this is a way to uh, to, to, to 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 get help people in your life get and to help yourself get there. It's really Hashem is with you. You're not alone with where you are. And uh, Dr. Breslin, you know, he wanted to share something. Am I right or wrong? No, I'm just walking and rolling and rolling stories to continue to. Okay. I sure would be like a fountain that I keep on enjoying. Thank you for compliment. Anyway, so, you see, like, just like that. If you made me feel good, so I have more confidence, I can let go of my shackles and tell you some more, more Judaism. That's how it works. That's how it works. That's how it works. This is real. When you, when someone, this, and, and this story, you have to remember the story I said before about the Rebbe. The Rebbe told me, you have it in your pure heart. You have it inside of you. Once if you said it to him, can you imagine, if they wouldn't have said it to him, how much stuff would he have given? He would have given and every day he would ask himself, he would feel bad and feel good. Be, and never says to him, just do what you really want to do. You have it inside of you. And that's what you have to realize. You have it in the Shama. Every day we start a day the same way. You gave me a soul. You you watch it in me. You guard it within me. I'm, I, you're, not, you're not leaving me by myself. Why? Because you care about me. You created me. Of course you care about me. Of course you, you, you want me. And you want, you want me. My mission is... is, is, is but before we say a bracha every day, I'm sorry, every bracha we say before every mitzvah, before every time we eat, we say, Melech Ha'olam, the king of the world. The mayor of Beverly Hills, he said that, uh, I don't remember which way mayor it was, it was a Jewish mayor, when he finished his tenure as mayor, he said, you know what I want, I want to accomplish as mayor? I want it to everyone to realize when it says BH on the signs of Beverly Hills, it really stands for Baruch Hashem. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> We're, we're in all kinds of places, we're all kinds of times, all kinds of moments, and, and, and time is, is, is so much so much change going on in each of our lives. The Alter Rebbe says you have to realize, oil, what, why we say Melech Ha'olam? Literally, Melech Ha'olam means king of the world. The Alter Rebbe said Melech Ha'olam. The world, the space you're in, what is it? It's a Hashem created the world because He wants to be a king. He wants to accomplish something. He wants His majesty to be manifest in a place that you're in by you connecting to him and do what Hashem wants you to do. In that space, in that time, in that moment. What is the space you're in? It's a place of Baruch Hashem. It's a place of Melech HaOlam. It's every bracha we begin with. Melech HaOlam. What is the world? The Alter Rebbe says the world is Melech. The world is a place of Hashem's sovereignty. That's where we are. Wherever we are, we're not, we're not alone. So we, we have, should help each of us. We should, we should feel this and realize this and give this to our to people in our life until we should see Bukhar of Mamish tonight, take me a Mamish. The Yulmit Hashem and Mashiach Tekenu will see the manifest love of Hashem for each of us. Amen. Amen.